And as Christ followers, especially if you were here last Sunday, you should know how dangerous loneliness is because it is the first thing that God declares not good in creation. See, God in, in creating the world, as Kevin described for us last week, is running through everything, and it's good, it's good. Snakes are good. Spiders are good. Tigers and bears, oh my, are good. All good. But Adam, the first human, by himself, not good. This comes to us from Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord said, it's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. I haven't unpacked that word helper for you, so I'm not going to dig into it. As a woman, I always kind of like cringe at the word helper, but it's a, it's a really powerful Hebrew word that is talking about a partner in life, one that sustains and joins you in the mission. But I want us to focus more on this idea of God declaring loneliness, the very first thing God declares not good, not necessarily sinful, but not good, is loneliness because we were created to be in community. We were created to be together. We were created to be alone. We we're created to be in healthy, life-giving relationships with our creator and with each other. We were created to be known and community, relationship. Is, it's not just good. It's very good. And we learn that there is no shame in the community, that the two could be naked. Yes, that's a physical nakedness with one another that the man and the woman had. But even more so, there's this idea of being spiritually, emotionally exposed to one another, vulnerable with one another in real ways. They felt no shame. They were fully themselves, warts and all. They didn't have to hide. They didn't feel the need to hide from one another. And hear me on this. This is not about marriage so much as it about relationship. God's original intention is for us to be safe with one another, to be in community, to belong with one another, to be able to know that it's okay. It's okay to be who I am. Now, understanding that God's intention, that there were supposed to be no barriers to connection, no division, no fighting. We also see in this first story that Adam and Eve choose another way. They choose to make themselves their own gods. And in doing so, they become disconnected from God, from the earth, from each other. No longer were they safe and free to be exactly as God created them to be. And now there is fear of judgment, fear of critique, relational realities of disrespect, rudeness, jealousy, slander, manipulation, withdrawal, insults, cutting words, all the things that we try to avoid in relationships or walk away from they now creep into our shared story. And it wasn't long before Adam and Eve are lonely, hiding from God, and turning against one another. They start playing the blame game really quickly. No, it's her. No, it's him. No, it's the snake. And it just devolves from there. And we as humans have wrestled with loneliness ever since. And let, let's be honest here. A lot of poor decisions are made based on our desire to be known, to connect, what is peer pressure, if not a desire to be accepted, to have a sense of belonging? How many poor relationships have started or continued too long because of a fear of loneliness? How many dysfunctional friendships have you put up with or tolerated because of a fear of loneliness? And yet, even in those situations where we feel like we have company and we don't have a lack of people, we still have a lack of connection because it's not safe, is it? You can be lonely at a party. You can be lonely at work. You can be lonely at school. You can be lonely at the Thanksgiving dinner table. And part of this, I think, is also due to our priorities, what we put an emphasis, what we strive for. We cram so much into our lives that we have no time for connection. We think, I need that extra degree, so I'm going to take on these classes. This job in this different city, it is the prime opportunity for me. Even though it's going to take me away from friends and family, I got to go for this. We love to travel every weekend. We're never home. This excessive need that we have to be plugged in to the internet, video games, or TV, disconnecting from people in the very room with us, or doom scrolling often on our phones, 
suddenly finding that we have lost hours of our day. Or maybe you have that need to live in a better neighborhood, a better school district, and again, you're moving away from the social connections you had in order to have a better social standing. And even though you know, we're going, oh, we can stay connected, is it really the same? Or do we explore all those millions of activities we involve ourselves in, or more importantly, we involve our children in for their betterment? We expect fulfilling relationships will somehow just magically fit in our very compressed free time. We'll cram it in the margins that we continue to expand into, margins that are slowly being eliminated. And there's no space for us to have real connection. We have surface conversations because we do not have time for anything more. Why do you think we answer when somebody asks, how are you doing? I'm fine. Because you don't have the time to explain that you're really not fine, and they probably don't want to hear it anyway because they don't have time to hear it. We are never alone, but we are lonely and unfulfilled. The thing is, though, we are not alone in this because even those of us in the room who are going, yeah, I feel that, we also worship a God who experienced loneliness. Jesus suffered from loneliness. Have you ever felt completely unseen by someone who was supposed to know you? someone who professes to love you but doesn't understand you. You're sitting there going, how could you not know this about me? How could you not even see my hurt and my struggle in this? How could you not see that I was so quiet at the dinner table, feeling completely unnoticed, unseen, unconnected? I can tell you my own experiences in this at times of being in a room full of friends that I love dearly, and they're having a conversation in which I cannot participate but also causes me deep pain because it is something I desperately want to be able to have a conversation about. I can remember in seasons of singleness going, yeah, I'd love to talk you know, smack about my partner. I'd love to complain about my children, but I don't have any. And it's made me in particular very sensitive at times of going, there are sometimes conversational topics that we need to recognize aren't for everyone or to make a way in for people because I've been on the outside before, even in the crowd, feeling ignored and left behind. Some of the loneliest moments in our lives are spent with friends and family. People who should know us don't see us. And I think this is exactly what Jesus experienced from his own family of origin. When the people who should have understood him the most totally don't get him. And Jesus turns around at this comment and does something very Jesus-like. He asks a question. If you've ever paid attention to what Jesus does and when he speaks, he asks more questions than he answers. I think that's interesting. Who are my mother, brothers, and sisters, he asks. And then Jesus does something very un-Jesus-like. He gives an answer. He answers his own question, even. Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother, sister, and mother. In this moment, Jesus defines the family of God. And it's not biological, it's not based on birth, it's not based on who you grew up with. It is based on connection and relationship. It's based on doing the will of God, being in relationship with God and in relationship with the people of God. That is what it is to be part of the family of God. 